All right, I think we can get started. Um, good afternoon and welcome to our December 7th flash webinar. Um, my name is Lindsay Elliott and I'm the Marketing and Communications Manager at Syscrip. Um, thank you for joining our discussion today on the Clinical Trial Challenge, Boosting Clinical Trial Appeal in Patient Communities. Um, so this webinar is brought to you by Rare Patient Voice, which provides patients and family caregivers with opportunities to participate in all types of research, including marketing research, re health, economic outcomes, and real-world evidence, user experience, human factor studies, and clinical trials. Um, RPV has over 100,000 patients and caregivers across more than 750 diseases, both rare and non-rare, in the US, Canada, UK, France, Germany, Italy, Spain, Australia, and New Zealand. Um, our moderator and panelists today include Amy Geetson, a patient advocate, columnist, and public speaker, um, and Wes Michael, president of Rare Patient Voice. Um, unfortunately, Sherry Wyman was unable to join us today, but hopefully you'll be able to hear from her in some of our future Flash webinars, so stay tuned for that. Um, and now I will turn it over to Wes to get us started. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Lindsay, and and thanks so much, uh, Amy, for for joining me here. It's 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 it's, it's great to talk with you. Um, the um, maybe before, before I I talk about this survey we did, a Amy um, Amy's a patient and a, a patient advocate for scleroderma. Amy, Amy, maybe say a few few words about that, and we'll get into the details. Sure. Thanks, Wes. I appreciate the opportunity to come and chat with you. Um, so I've been a patient first and foremost of scleroderma for about two decades. Uh, I was diagnosed at 19 and scleroderma is a pretty, um, uh, it's a multifaceted disease that affects not only the outside, but the inside. Um, I do a lot of community work and uh, provide patients with resources, support and things like that. So um, I'm just excited to represent the community. Well, great. I'm, I'm looking forward to some of your, your, your takes on some of the things that we found. So. Rare Patient Voice ran a survey a couple months ago. We went out to almost 2,000 of our patients and family caregivers in the United States. And we asked a lot of different questions regarding uh, what the patients liked and or didn't like regarding clinical trials. Many people had participated and some hadn't. So we wanted to get opinions of both. Um, uh, last month, my colleague Pam and her guest uh, Grace did a, uh, one of these webinars and they focused on issues of reimbursement and the location of clinical trials. Today, we're, we're going to focus on one, one issue that really came up as also is very important to so many patients. It was the issue of communication. And uh, so we're not going to dwell a lot on research. If you go to the next slide, one of the um, uh, things that we found out was an overwhelming number of the respondents, both patients and family caregivers, said that receiving information on the goals of the trial prior to beginning it was very important to them, extremely appealing to them. So uh, they want to be well informed before the trial begins. They want information about that. And let's look at the second slide too before we come back, back to this. This is the second research slide. Um, let's see if we go to that next one for a second. Completion. Oh, no, you're right. Maybe I'm wrong. That, that, that slide. Yeah, thanks. Uh, we also found an equally overwhelming number of patients said that they wanted to see results of the what what the trial had found after the completion of the trial, what were the results of the trial? So we're getting two overwhelming things about communication in a couple different ways, uh, early on and, and after it. And as you'll see, I think during is, is just as important. Um, Amy, thinking about communication of trials and your experience, both as a, a well, talk about you know your, your experience as a, as, a, as a in trials and working with others in trials. What's your take on on all this? Sure. So I think communication is a big, big thing for patients. Um, we're always looking to understand what's going on with our body and what treatments are best for us um, and educate ourselves. So I think with clinical trials, you know, I've had a lot of experiences where the information wasn't as easy to disseminate um, and understand as a patient. Um, a lot of it is a lot of medical terms, some patients don't really know the gist of what they're signing up for. And then after what the overall outcome was of what they did. So I think these graphs and surveys show exactly what we want, which is to be communicated with better, told 
why we're going to be participating in the study, what they're going to be hoping to get at the end of it, and then at the end, moving forward, what that, what our participation helped them, what was the goal? Yeah, isn't it, 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 don't they say like, the key to any good relationship is communication, right? So uh, we're, we're hearing, and, that, and this is a relationship, right? If you're in a long-term trial, uh, going in every month or whatever it might be, uh, it's quite a relationship and people want communication. But you, you, you made a point that made me think of how it's disseminated, how, how it's worded. I'm involved with a wonderful group, uh, this uh, market research uh, related group in Telus Worldwide. They have a whole committee that's been studying, they call it health literacy. How to, how to communicate. And it's not just for people that don't, I mean, it starts off as how do you communicate to people that might not be all that sophisticated, but guess what? It helps everybody because even a Harvard PhD might not really understand all these health terms and medical terms. And if you look at a, uh, a clinical uh, journal article based on one of these studies and you try to read it, you need a lot of translation help with that. So, I mean, have you seen examples where they've done a a good or a poor job or any any suggestions on how to make it word it so that people can actually understand it? Sure, it's right. interesting that you say that because I've been working with a, um, an, organiza an organization just recently who has taken exactly what we're doing, communicating with patients and clinical trials and learning how to include patients in the process of dissemination and being able to understand. And then us as patients, talking about what we learned through these trials. So I think in the beginning when I was diagnosed and I started to participate really heavily in clinical trials, um, I couldn't understand really anything, yeah. the, the graphs, the data, what I was looking at. Um, it's, very, it's highly intellectual information, rightfully so. But I think that um, over the years I've, I've learned what to look for and key words. But I also think that it has to be able to be something that all patients can understand, whether you're 20 years in or two years in. Um, and I think that's where the disconnect is. Yeah, that, that's interesting. I mean, do you think that that how they communicate um, the language used is also important just to get the word out? I mean, I think one of the key issues we've heard is people don't necessarily know about clinical trials. You know, how do they find out about ones that could save their lives or their loved ones? For sure. I think too, um, you know, the more patients that you get to understand what it is and the goal and what you're trying to do, the more they'll want to share with other people. I think it's really important that um, patients be able to communicate not only with uh, what they're doing in clinical trials, but also with each other to say, hey, I did this great trial. This is what I learned from it, or this is what they did. You should sign up or you should look into it. It really helped me or whatever the case may be. Um, I think patients would be a lot more receptive to sign up and be, participate in clinical trials. And I know that has been an issue as well, getting patients to want to participate. I know because uh, many people might know about a, a, a site called clinicaltrials.gov. And on the one hand, what a, what a wonderful idea to have a one database where you can go and look up your disease and find all the trials and the locations, what they're getting at. On the other hand, people that have tried to use that, uh, I hear, yeah, it's, it's it not, not user-friendly. You know, you don't quite understand what you're looking at and if it's appropriate, and then they, then they, they give up. So there's got to be a better way to get the word out in a way that's... Uh, understand. I mean, what do they say about communication? It's not just getting it out. It has to, it's not successful unless the other person and the, the receiver of it uh, gets it. So really, I mean, from talking to patients, uh, I like to stress to companies running these, I know you've got rules and regs about what you need to say, but when you're communicating to patients, turn it around, make sure, right? Patients know, uh, test them. With it. They, you know, it's like anything when you, you communicate, you always, what do they tell you to do? Ask people to, to what, what did you get from that? Do you understand what I'm saying? Really go back and forth. Don't just say, uh, do you understand? Because everybody else nod their head and say yes, whether they understand. I, or you not. know, I think it's important too that when these companies or organizations or uh, pharmaceutical places are putting these trials and things together to ask the patient what they would like to see, what makes uh -huh. sense to them, what would attract them to wanting to participate because um, we're, as patients, we're going to be the ones that are doing it. So you want to make sure that our needs are being met. And that goes along with communication as well. 
you're right. You really need to, to find out what's going to attract or repel people and how to do whatever you can within your power to do that. And it's all, again, what everything in life seems to boil down to communication. How are you saying it? What are you trying to say? And are you are you succeeding in saying it? Uh, let's, let's go to the next slide. I think it's interesting to look at uh, that. Uh, a lot of the patients, they had an opportunity to write in a lot of comments. And there were 2,000 of them. And I actually read them all because I felt obligated to. The, uh, my, eyes were, my eyes were going crazy. But anyway, uh, let's look at some of what they said about communication. Um, getting an understanding of the treatment under development. So uh, we talked a little bit about communicating what the trial is about, but they want to know about the treatment itself. Uh, uh, what aspects of that Amy, do you think people are interested in? I think for, uh, if I speak for myself, I was really interested in if I'm getting this, this drug and I'm on this trial, am I going to be able to have access to this drug after the trial? Uh -huh. um, am I going to, what are the side effects under this trial? How long am I going to have to be um, taking this medication or am I going to have to stop some of my other medications? So I think those are all key things that patients really want to understand. Yeah, so there's a, there's a whole a whole gamut of things. And I guess talking to patients will, will, will pull this out because uh, treatment and development, then it's learning about the trial before the start of screening, having a full understanding of what it hopes to discover. So what are they, what are they after? Uh, what, is it a cure? Is it a, uh, an incremental improvement? Uh, I think it this one that you're, market, right? sorry, Wes, I think this one that you, that is on here is really quite interesting. The 24-7 uh -huh. contact for emergencies uh -huh. and concerns. Um, you know, that's something I have never experienced thus far in my, you know, with my relation to clinical trials and research, but I think it's a great idea. Um, a lot of the times when you're doing these things, everything's so new. So I think that having somebody available to answer your questions or concerns or symptoms, or, you know, if you have a freak out as a patient, I think that's, right. that would be a great addition. Yeah. Because if you were having some kind of a reaction and you might think, is it, it's like anything, sometimes you want to call a doctor, is this a side effect of what I'm doing? Is it something completely unrelated? And just to, even if it's, if it's just to confirm you or, or give, make you at peace with it, not, not, it's not an issue. It's nice to have somebody there and, and 24 seven, right? Because inevitably this is, it's, a, it's midnight when this thing happens, right? You're right. Like, always. Right morning. <laughs> <laughs> always. <laughs> So, so, so I, I like that idea that they brought up. The next one they mentioned, like communication app or platform for use to use during the trial. Have you ever seen anything like that? I, you know, I have not thus far, um, but I don't think it's anything that's not doable. I mean, we're using um, medical charts and things like that all online and all with apps now. So it's something that can really be utilized to, to the fullest extent. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, let's take advantage, right? Communicate. And the last one, and, I, and you know, these things go so fast. We're already getting towards the last minutes. I know. But I, I like this. Their hands. You don't be <laughs> contact with other people. You don't think about it. You usually think patients relating to the researcher, the physician. This is saying patients want to be related to other people. I don't know if that's always possible, but but what benefits do you think that might bring? I think it's super beneficial. You know, when you're going through a trial as a patient. You want to be able to talk to somebody who maybe went through the same thing as you. You want to be able to ask them questions. Was this difficult? Is there a restaurant where I'm going to be staying? Is there a Walmart where I can go get groceries? What's the easiest route to get to the hospital? All those things. So I know it might not be feasible, but I think it's necessary. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting idea because, again, people, nobody wants to feel alone, right? If they know other people are suffering and they can learn so much from others that are going through the same thing. Yeah, so absolutely. I hope, um, when, when these things are possible, I hope those of you out there that are working on trials on um, developing them, take these into account. Talk to the patient, see, see what might help. Because they can only, have, guess what, help. Because it'll get more people involved in your trial. What, what, what a wonderful, wonderful thing. I know that's, that's a key issue these days is getting enough patients enrolled. So um, great to hear what some of these patients uh, are interested in. Um, I think we're getting towards... Is the end of our time. Let's see. Well, we certainly want to say thank you. Um, and uh, we even have a nice little uh, QR code there that you can go on and get more information. Uh, so I like to say thanks, Amy, thanks so much.
I always oh, love talking to you. you. Great point of view. Um, thanks for representing patients as well as yourself. And Lindsay, thanks to the Syscript folks for helping make trials possible, right? Yes, thank you, Wes, and thank you, Amy, so much for the discussion today. It was great, and thank you to Rare Patient Voice for sponsoring this webinar. Um, we'll be following up for any questions after the webinar that we weren't able to get to by email, and there will be a webinar recording available on our website at syscript.org. Um, so thank you all. I hope you have a great rest of your day. All right, thanks. Bye, guys.